Can you hear me? Yes. Guys, can you hear me? Yes, we're live. Okay. Hello there, and welcome to the Second Life Book Club. My name is Draxter Dupre. Uh, we meet here every Wednesday with readers, writers, publishers, and monsters, apparently. Um, we decorated the book club today in a way that, that may or may not uh, be epilepsy-inducing, so uh, I'm not sure what to do with these monsters. The reason why... <laughs> why we have these monsters here is uh, because there is a very, very special guest. We don't do this every day, but we're doing it for this guest. Uh, you don't see the guest quite yet. I don't know where the camera is. If the camera is on me as close up, then you don't see him, but uh, maybe you do see him. So let me let me step through a few housekeeping notes and then get let's get right to the show. Now, uh, the book club is every Wednesday at 12 o'clock. We meet here with readers, writers, sometimes publishers, sometimes editors, people who cherish the written word, and we discuss writing and, and reading. I put out a list on bookshop.org every week. We're not sponsored by them, but I do like their business model. They're strengthening local stores and events, bookshop.org. Draxter Reads is the uh, my little uh, store there. I would like to thank our team who helps put this show together. Strawberry Linen, who is in charge of camera and streaming. Brett from Linen Lab helps out with security marketing. Patch Linen, the whole governance team, including our moles. Marianne McCann customized the venue. Kralos dresses up the avatars. Big thanks to Silas Merlin, who makes special swag and other custom avatars. AJ McDowell. Uh, made the uh, wonderful uh, Second Life coffee mug that's on the table. You can click and you get a uh, copy that you can drink. We have a new partnership with Slink. Slink is the maker of fine SL skins. I think the uh, website is slinkstyle.com. Now, today's guest is Matt Ruff, author of many fine books. His latest is 88 Names, which is all about multiplayer games and virtual reality he has been here before he prefers a katoodle themed embodiment with matching <laughs> hat and flip-flops hello matt and thank you for coming well thank you for having me it's good now, to be back you know today is interesting because hbo just announced that lovecraft country which is based on your uh, book with the same title is coming august 16 and you know, I, I just got off the phone with um with hbo and they told me to put these monsters out but then uh, they were uh, afraid of lawsuits so maybe i should uh, delete them what do you think uh you know it, it yes go ahead and and switch them off so just yeah otherwise I, <laughs> i'm getting a i'm getting a claw constantly in my face well that's well, that's weird now we've got one kind of through the okay. Now that one disappeared too. They're gone. I mean, the, the TV was behind you. There was there was Trump and Bush on the TV behind you. So I mean, at least you were shielded a little bit. <laughs> I say this all the time, but the average avatar when a guest comes here can run up to seven thousand linden dollars. But you chose this avatar uh, for for uh, two hundred fifty linden dollars. So thank you, Matt, for for bringing. I mean, we we are on a tight budget here at the book club, as you know. So we appreciate when when authors are sort of self motivated uh, and go onto the marketplace. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I honestly, I part of it is I didn't know the exchange rate. So anything with thousand in it, I just figured that's got to be wrong. So let me pick something less expensive. So <laughs> that is actually there. That's a that's a good part of the uh, little lab business model that they don't. I don't actually know if they they put the exchange rate out there. Um, but so uh, we will we will do a lot of readings today. We have you for the hour, which is awesome. Last time you were here, there was a, a panel. So now we have much more time to go into your your uh, work. And we'll talk about the latest book, 88 Names, as well. And we'll do readings, short readings of all the books. I want to start with a brief confession. I am uh, a super fan of yours now. I have read all your books. Uh, the humor, well, the humanity, you. they resonate so deeply Matt, and, and here's the weird thing. I noticed that because I love your work so much, I find myself strangely compelled to prove this to you. It's it's almost as I met James <laughs> Hetfield from Metallica in 1987. I was a huge Metallica fan. And 
I, I was standing there and he was very nice, very low key. And I just could not articulate how much the music meant to me. Uh, I wondered, does this, this, this happen to you? Does this happen to authors like it happens to, you know, musicians or, 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 or sports stars? Like when you go into a, into a signing uh, copies at a, at, a, at a store or something like that, do you, do you encounter people who are very, very nervous and, and, and try to uh, go into the minutia of your characters and try to prove to you somehow that uh, they understand what you were going for and stuff like that? Oh, I mean, I, I think it, it cuts both ways. I actually thought you were going to ask me why I ever do this to other authors, and the answer is, I think every, I think everybody oh, has do this, this experience. Ah, okay, okay. I mean, it's not so much you know trying to prove yourself, but it's definitely the case. You you meet somebody whose work you really admire, and you yeah, you you can't. It's very difficult to relate to them just as a a person for that you know at least until you get used to them. So it, this happens to everybody, and I've I've been on both sides of it. So. Um, yeah, I, I specifically remember chatting one time with the author John Crowley, and I got a plot point wrong in something I was talking about, and was horribly embarrassed, and like he didn't care. But you know, yeah. So it happens to everyone. Ah, um, uh, that that makes me feel a lot better because I don't want to wake up in the middle of the night and go like, you know, this plot point that I pointed out to Matt. This is a completely half-ass analysis that I threw out there. Oh my god. Yeah. So this. But it's interesting that this also happens cross discipline, I guess. I mean, I'm not an aspiring novelist or anything. I'm just a big fan uh, of of I mean, your books are so, you know, they to me, they are like a good Frank Zappa composition. I know i'm I'm obsessed with with <laughs> Zappa and and you are not, but i I, I, I implore you, you gotta check out Zappa because that that's the music to your books. Your books are so expansive with all these millions of subplots, but then they're so tight at the same time. I mean, actually, my first question before we before we go through the work chronologically, it, it feels they're getting a little bit more streamlined, the books, I guess. I mean, when I look at Fool on the Hill, which has... Um, not goblins, but sprites. They have talking dogs and cats. They have sort of a meta narrator who pens all this the 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 story. They it has um uh it, it has rats that that are in a war with the sprites all on the Cornell University campus. And then we go to eighty eight names, which is just sort of a streamlined, I guess, thriller. But but do you see it that way? Do you analyze your own stuff? I, I mean, I think more, you, yeah. yeah, you can you can break my novels roughly into two eras, and I, I think the 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 sort of books where I was still kind of figuring myself out were probably Fool in the Hill and Sewer Gas and Electric, and that was a point when I was willing to just throw in the whole kitchen sink into the story and make it work, and and you know, and it, fortunately, I was actually pretty good at finding ways to to you know take these overstuffed elements and make them make sense but um i think starting with set this house in order and then definitely moving forward from there i've become more selective in not just including everything i think of but just really being very very you know trying to yeah make it all work together and pull in the same direction so and um uh, that you know may affect how I mean it, that that may be better or worse depending on on when you first got to know my work. I think there are people who love the Fool in the Hill, the younger stuff, and then there are are people who are got to know me through my later novels, and they go back to the earlier ones and like, what the heck is this? You know why? But that's the other thing about my writing is that every novel is a it's sort of a different genre and a different take. So more generally, I, I have fans who are fans of the one book, and I have fans who are the blessed fans are willing to follow me anywhere. So, but yes, there's but definitely. That's, but that's what you have in common with Zappa. See, I started uh, listening to Zappa when I wanted to be the best guitar player in the universe. And then I got into the conservatory and then I discovered Zappa from backwards from the guitar stuff in the eighties, all the way back to when he worked with the, the London symphony. And uh, yeah, it was, it, it's interesting that you note that because it, it does depend I guess people could discover you now and they could go back and they could not like your expansive crazy stuff. I'm not saying that 88 names is not crazy. I think the the wonderful crazy No, but there's it's definitely yeah, it's it's definitely a different style and pacing than than the earlier novels and um yeah, uh so that's just part of 
I, I think maturing as a novelist and, and getting a better sense of what I wanted to keep and what I didn't want to keep. And just because I had an idea, doesn't mean it necessarily has to be in the novel. So, uh, you and catalog, yeah, you catalog these ideas that you don't use. You have a, Oh, I mean the stuff that doesn't pan out, it still sticks in my brain somewhere. And if it's useful, it'll come back somewhere else. So yeah, it's, it's not like, I never make notes because I figure if, if an idea is good enough to use again, I won't forget it or I will remember it when the time comes. And uh, oh. so far, yeah, that's, that's not always true. Matt, you do. I work with a stoner uh, who was, uh, we work with the guy who produced Queen and he was, this guy was a total stoner and that's what he would say. And we were in the studio, we were jamming and he came up with the greatest riff of all times. And I said, please write this down or let's go downstairs and record it. He said, no, 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 I'll remember it tomorrow. And I said, no, you won't. And I said, okay. And he said, if I don't remember it, it wasn't that good. And mm -hmm. he didn't, re well, it had to do with the intake of, uh, of the weed, I believe. If if he didn't have that, he might have remembered it the next day. Yeah, that's also yeah, it can be a problem, I guess. But yeah, no, it's it's I I, I just yeah, I've never been much of a note taker that way because I would lose the notes if I did take them. I would you know write a, write them in a file somewhere and lose the file. So, um, I wanted to also in the audience. I want to ask the audience uh, and put this in chat, please. Have you read? Met Ruff because at the end of this hour I'll ask again which book w uh, will you pick up. So be honest, you know there's no there's no shame in admitting that you don't know who this guy is. Um, Cam asked, do you suggest reading Lovecraft Country before watching the show? We'll talk about this later. This is this is one of my favorite topics: shows versus books. In the background, you can see I, uh, as proof of uh, how big of a fan I am, I have to <laughs> uh, taken a uh, photo of my bookshelf, and here's the entire Matt Ruff catalog, and the German translation, which I think is excellent. Next to the Second Life books, uh, the scripting guide, and on the other side is Erich Maria Remarque. Um, so it's squeezed in there. Um, now, uh, Matt, why don't we actually go through go through the the catalog a little bit? If if I may ask you to um, step off the uh, Cthulhu chair, and so we're going to do the Matt Ruff tasting menu a little bit from each of the books. I gather that's correct. That's correct. It's a ninety minute infomercial, and we're going to go through <laughs> all of these things. <laughs> And actually, the other thing that I wanted to tell you, uh, you know, full disclaimer, as you know, because we talked about this when I talked with you first, is uh, that you told me um, that you're doing a lot of these appearances. And, and another thing you do, you, you blog about the background of uh, the origin of your books on, on, on your website. And I try to stay away from that. And I also try to stay away from watching your your interviews because I wanted to come in fresh with, with, with sort of my take on I, who I think you, well, who you are to me and, and, and who you are for the audience. But uh, I'm also very self-conscious about uh, not wasting your time with questions that you get asked over and over. So now I'm oh, upset. No, I, don't, about... I don't mind that. It's as long as I, as long as I can come up with something original to say, I'm fine with being asked the same question. <laughs> this is the whole meta. The, the, the whole audience is now a sort of uh, a, a, a audience to our private uh, counseling session. I just don't know who the psychiatrist is, me or you, or, or maybe somebody in the audience. Now the first book here, this came around, came out, I believe in 1988. Is that correct? Fool on the Hill. Yeah, 1988. It was. Uh, yeah, it was my college senior thesis, actually. Uh, and for a wonder, it got published. Uh, it got sold like four months after I graduated. My um, one of my English teachers hooked me up with her agent, who really liked my writing, and uh, Melanie Jackson, who's been my basically made my career possible. And so she sold the book right away, and it was published the year after I graduated college. And uh, I've managed to avoid honest work ever since. So, quick side question: Did you at, at this early stage were you uh, uh, aware, or were you was there jealousy within uh, your uh, the crowd in the um, your your student colleagues? I I mean, I the thing was I. I, I I had some close friends who also wrote, but I, I as far as I, I never really considered myself part of a writing group. Like I took creative writing classes, so I would get credit for what I was going to do anyway. So yes, there was general jealousy just among people in those kinds of courses, but I, I wasn't really because I didn't really hang out with a lot of writers outside of of 
uh, class. I, I didn't necessarily feel it. I didn't feel snubbed by it, but I'm, I'm sure there were people who were, you know, but there were a lot of people who were very happy for me too. Like my real friends were thrilled. So, um, there you have but, it audience. Stay away from uh, be be in solitude. Don't, don't, uh, go with the clicks if you're in a creative endeavor. So, Maybe. okay. Yeah, um, yes, I will. I, this is just a little bit from fool on the hill. Um, and this is the father of, uh, Aurora Borealis, who is the love interest of the main character. So, right. Let, uh, let me sit. Let oh, me oh, add please, uh, go ahead. A, a couple things because, um, so, this book, and I'm not going to attempt to to summarize it. By the way, in the chat, you see a lot of people uh, already stating their preferences. The Mirage set this house in order, Lovecraft and Gas. Fool on the Hill, the, the pl a plot summary uh, would take us, uh, I don't know how long it would take us, but it's absolutely- Most of the hour, yeah. Yes. It is so ch chock full of stuff. I mean, it's it's amazing. There, I said that there's sprites, evil reds, rats, a dog, a cat looking for heaven in in sort of a road movie type subplot, and the excerpt that you're reading. Oh, there's also the the bo Bohemian fraternities and they're fighting good versus evil. There's a rubber doll possessed by evil spirit, and there's a little uh, Stephen King in there too with the with the obsessed truck. I guess she's yes. driving the truck. But the excerpt that you're reading is uh, the father of one of the main protagonists, Aurora. He, I think, self-describes as super ordinary. Um, and he hopes that the biggest hope in his life is that his children become nonconformists. He's kind of obsessed with that. And here he goes out. And one of the things that's nonconformist uh, that he does is smoke weed in the morning. <laughs> and, and he is sort of reminiscing about his three children. One of them pa uh, passed. Uh, again, with the obsession or with the hope that that one of them turns out to be nonconformist and not ordinary as he is. Please, Matt. Walt was still playing touch and go with reality. He'd overdone it on the stump, smoking two joints and getting a good start in the third, not realizing until too late how hard it was going to hit him. He felt numb all over, his thoughts heavy limbed. The most annoying property of a marijuana high was that it became impossible to concentrate on more than one thing at a time, and even that one thing had a way of sl slipping out from under you. Aurora scrambled eggs and went on about her date last night while Walter's mind pinwheeled back to the past, to his sons. Aurora had come along very late in the game, a surprise package of a birth, but earlier on, Walter and Prudence had made two boys together. Ed, the eldest, was a straight arrow, more run-of-the-mill than his own father. Walter had watched him carefully for any signs of the occasional digression, but there had been none. He lived in Minnesota with a sedate Methodist wife and two children of his own, worked as a consultant for an insurance firm, and sent a card every Christmas, Mother's, and Father's Day. The other boy, Jesse, had come out of the womb only after a long and drawn-out delivery, a screaming bloody murder, a world beater from the very first. During the Vietnam War, Jesse had been at Berkeley, marching in protest, getting arrested on an average of once a month. He had written home frequently about his exploits, sending newspaper clippings, and once his face had appeared briefly in a crowd on an evening newscast. Toward the end, Walter had begun to suspect that Jesse had a boyfriend out there as well. This had never been confirmed, but Walt had felt a touch of pride over it all the same. It would have been wonderfully unorthodox, though what Prudence might have thought. Four days before his graduation, Jesse had been struck and killed by a car just outside of campus. The driver had not been drunk, merely looking the wrong way at the wrong time. And to Walter, that seemed the cruelest thing of all, that there should be nowhere to lay blame, no one to shake a fist at, except perhaps fate. He had cried a long time over Jesse. In a way, he had to admit to himself, he never could have cried over Ed. And he might have proved inconsolable if not for something that Aurora, barely five at the time, had done for him. She had stolen him a bouquet, not just gathered it, but stolen it crawling under fences and sneaking into private gardens all over town, and in one instance, according to her story, playing hide-and-seek with a very big Doberman pincher to bring back a diverse collection of flowers. Roses, marigolds, tulips, daffodils, peonies, others he couldn't even name. She gave him the bouquet and told him all about how she had come by it and told him he could stop being so sad now. Everything would be all right. He still had every one of the flowers pressed between the pages of a hardbound copy of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer that lay in his bottom dresser drawer. He also still had the kernel of hope for her that had been born in him that day, for she'd had Jesse's look in her eyes, dormant but there all the same, waiting to be brought to life. If only it hadn't been for Brian Garraway. So Brian said, Brian was Aurora's steady boyfriend, had been since high school. To be brutally honest, he was her fiance in everything but name. 
All that remained was the buying of a ring and setting a date, a formality that would probably be taken care of by Thanksgiving break, Christmas at the latest. And then, then it would be too late. And Brian, Walter was quite aware that to most parents, Brian would have seemed like perfect son-in-law material. He was a good fellow, clean cut, about to graduate with a degree in hotel administration from one of the better universities in the country. Brian was also a born again Christian, a steadfast believer who had no patience with drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, or pornography, or world beating. To see Brian marching in support of a liberal protest, Walt was convinced, would be a sure sign of a coming apocalypse. A nice kid, all things considered, one who would never break the rules, one who would marry, take his place as a productive member of society, raise a nice average family, and never do anything noteworthy in his entire life. And we, we, that was another thing about Brian. He seemed to be in love with the first person plural. We this and we that. If you let him, he'd do your talking and even your thinking for you. Walter feared this especially, that Brian would wear away to nothing out of the best of intentions whatever remained of that little girl who had once stolen him a bouquet. And that is Matt reading from Fool on the Hill. Thank you, Matt. This this is just, I mean, I... I'm just giggling uh, at, at reading this. I read this in German and in English. I was swapping back and forth. I mean, the translation is so good. When we have time later, I'm going to talk about your relationship with 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 translators and and all that. And uh, Biomarek, she says here in the um, chat, reads like Kerouac, beat poetry style. I think also that's your <laughs> your delivery. I mean, it's it's great. Um, now let's move on to uh, to. Uh, to public work, the public works trilogy. Hold on, let me uh, change the cover here in the back. Uh, the public works trilogy came out, I believe, in um, in ninety seven or ninety eight. I and think ninety eight. I'm not sure on that one. Actually, it's been yeah. a while. Um, this is another one with a convoluted plot, and I say convoluted in the end with as a huge compliment. Uh, I'm not going to summarize it either. There's a billionaire. It plays in the future, plays in 2023. There's a billionaire. His name is Harry Gant. And he, uh, someone doesn't care about money, uh, which is stra strange for a billionaire. But he keeps making billions. And he fights against eco terrorists. These eco terrorists are in a submarine, which was originally built by Howard Hughes and launched in Lake Erie with kangaroos on board. Um, uh, Yes, and so this this particular section is part of a longer, a much more convoluted story where one of Gant's employees has basically figured out where where the eco terrorist Philo Dufresne has hidden his submarine, and so he's sort of giving the backstory of how he knows this. Um, right, and and one more thing, what you're reading also, and thank you for contextualizing this. That this is indeed a, a, an important subplot where um, the 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 person that is speaking now they are refugees. Um, and Harry Gant, that billionaire, has a nonprofit that is called the Department of Public Opinion, and that's teaching promising refugees who come to America for whatever reason, mainly out of uh, war zones, uh, to, I guess, succeed in, in the capitalist endeavor. And, and working uh, in advertising, basically. Working yeah. in, uh, right, you're right, you're right. We're, exactly. See, this is Zappa again, The Adventures of Gregory Peckery. you got to listen to that. Okay, sorry, Matt. Now, <laughs> here is the uh, the excerpt, and I think one of the refugees, Bartholomew, Bartholomew uh, from yes, Bartholomew from yes. The cult of cargo, Gant repeated. Is that anything like Dianetics? No, sir, I don't think so. Although I don't know that much about Dianetics. The cult of cargo first flourished on Fiji in the 1880s. The natives who lived there, having had glimpses of European and American affluence, decided that they deserved the same luxuries enjoyed by the white man. But they weren't an educated people, and they knew nothing about the industrial revolution of the means of production. They assumed, reckoning from what little they did know, that all they needed to do was build docks, lighthouses, and custom stations, or at least the best imitations of these things that they could construct from the crude materials they had on hand, and ships would appear by magic, bearing cargo. As time passed and the cult spread to other parts of the Melanesian chain, it evolved, adapted to more modern circumstances. My own family joined the cult in 1935, and instead of a dock, they built an airstrip with burning torches for landing lights and a driftwood ticket counter. They took the name From for John From, the white pilot who was supposed to fly out of the clouds in a Red Cross plane and bring them electric lights, automobiles, and Coca-Cola. Huh, Harry Gant said. Huh, how about that? Of course, the plane never came. And eventually they gave up. Oh no, no, sir. 
I, I guess in that sense, it is like Dianetics. The magic didn't work, but the cult never quite died out. It just changed tactics. In 1940, after five years without a single cargo plane landing, the Frums took a more aggressive stance. They pulled what few valuables they had and bartered a one-way steamship passage to America for my grandfather, whom they called Little John Frum. His mission was to find and kidnap President Roosevelt, or buy him if that was possible, and bring him back alive to Melanesia. Once the Frum had, Frums had their own American president, the cargo planes were sure to come. And it goes on much longer from there, but that's I, the I, I just want to say that some of these excerpts, I really took like I was just sort of at random opening the book and I was like, yeah, this is very funny. And now I'm realizing, you know, if you don't know what's going on, you certainly don't know what's going on now. But this is this is just so fantastic. This sentiment comes through, Matt, that you're this style. I mean, it's like in every it, it, it fascinates me. Were you secure about your style early on? How did you get confident about? Uh, plowing through with Fool on the Hill and 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 sewer gas and electric, which also features um, Meister Boy, which is a shark in the uh, in the, the sewer system. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, I think part of it is I just decided at a very young age that this is what I wanted to do, and it just honestly didn't occur to me that it wouldn't work out. Um, so part of it was just a you know sort of youthful naivete that that. Um, I'm just going to do this and and see how it works. And I I was writing primarily to please myself, so that was my my earliest. Like you know, I I could tell whether stuff was working for me, and then obviously there was the hope that it would work for enough enough other people to allow me to do this for a living. But so it wasn't you know it was a combination of just but it was the confidence born of just not not worrying too much about how things were going to work out, and then you know by the time I I got self conscious enough to be worried, I'd yeah. already felt confident enough in, in what I was able to do. So I, I yeah. this is fascinating because as you know, I mean, this can be, uh, I studied at the conservatory and there were, there were a lot of really great musicians in the beginning and they were already so, um, they had, they, they were obsessed with originality, but at the same time, they, they just did not have the, uh, you know, whatever you call it, the, the, the guts to just go like, you know, whatever the F, I'm just going to push this thing out and don't don't care. So so that that uh, what you're saying is, uh, I guess, uh, kids in the audience or aspiring writers um, start early. Um, try to be well, the thing is, if you're if you're writing to please yourself first, one of the things that that gives you is you don't expect everybody to share your taste. So. I, I don't necessarily take it as a slight if somebody reads one of my books and says, ah, I, you know, this didn't work for me because it's not supposed to work for everybody. It's got to work for me. If you can convince me on my own terms that the book's not working, that's one thing. But if it's just like, well, I, you know, you wrote this and I wanted something else, that's mm -hmm. fine. I, mm -hmm. you know, I, it's not personal that way. So, and I think that's, that's probably the biggest key to me is not falling into the trap. I know a lot of people have imposter syndrome, but I'm not, I'm not pretending to be a universal, mm -hmm. you know, the novel for everyone. I want to write specific, you know, books and stories tailored to a specific sensibility and, and hopefully have enough cross appeal that other people will want to look at that. Um, but you know, yeah, I, I, it doesn't hurt my feelings if somebody isn't necessarily into the same things I am. And even in academia, when you, when you studied uh, back in the day, when a teacher would would critique your work, but I mean, I don't know how your uh, university. My, my teachers, was... I, the teachers I work with, were actually quite open minded. It was other students who sometimes would have problems with it. But again, it was just mm -hmm. like, okay, if your if your motivation in criticizing me is just that you're, um, you know, you're, uh, you know, you're you're annoyed with this because it's not what you would do. I don't necessarily care, you know. I, I mean, unless there's an interesting point in there somewhere, but. Yeah. Um, that's wonderful. I mean, this is this is wonderfully said. I'm going to clip this and and send it to my son, who is a very gifted musician, but who is also 16, and all the turmoil that is happening at that age, uh, trying to uh, fit in with others. And um, I always tell him, you know, be proud of what what uh, what you can do. Don't uh, just do it. Uh, next excerpt here. This is this is an, an amazing book. Set this house in order. And as a matter of fact, AJ McDowell just said in the chat she's reading it right now. So set this house in order. I I read this last uh, for whatever reason. Um, it's about multiple personality disorder. The the protagonist in this uh, story has a house in his head that is populated by 
uh, the other souls. And uh, the house is run by his father. Um, Andrew, uh, the protagonist, Andrew Gage, is traumatized. Uh, we're not going to uh, spoil anything. Uh, but he uh, developed a multiple personality dis disorder, as many people do, out of uh, trauma. And he manages this this condition very well, actually, with, with the house um, in yeah, his he head. Basically, yeah, it's like he's got his own virtual reality set up in his head where his different people can see and talk to one another. And there's a father soul who sort of makes the rules and controls who can take over the body when. And Andrew, who's the narrator of this story, is is created specifically to take over the job of dealing with the outside world. So it's sort of his coming of age story in a way. And he meets someone named Penny Driver, who turns out is also multiple, but hasn't figured it out yet. And um, mm -hmm. she just knows she loses time and finds herself in weird situations and doesn't know why. And some of her more aware alternate personalities, you know, basically figure out that Andrew is is multiple and and want his help and sort of try to demand his help. She, so exactly, she demand she is threatening in the sense that she is pushy about uh, Andrew helping her, and Andrew has it uh, together pretty pretty much with with this house, and Penny is just a total mess. And the excerpt that you're reading now is. Uh, where the 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 father uh, brings all the people together in the house in Andrew's head to to talk about the penny driver uh, situation. situation. Yeah. Yes. Simon raised a hand. How dangerous is this penny driver? He asked. Would she really hurt the body? My father turned to Adam. The soul we saw today is capable of real violence. Adam said. Seferis and I are sure about that. We don't think it actually wants to hurt us, but it might if it got mad enough. Well then, said Simon, looking directly at me, somebody ought to call the police. There's no reason why we should have to tolerate even the possibility of violence. Several other souls around the table murmured agreement. Andrew, my father prompted me. I don't think we need to get the police involved, I said, startled by the suggestion. I mean, yes, what happened today was upsetting, but I think Adam's right. The intention wasn't to hurt us. It's just, they want help. This isn't about harming us or making us feel bad. Penny's souls want help, and for better or worse, they're convinced that we can give it to them. And I guess they're a little desperate about it. That doesn't justify threats, exclaimed Simon, or chasing people in cars. We needed help, I reminded him. Are you going to tell me we were never so demanding that it scared somebody? What are you suggesting, Andrew, my father asked. Are you saying we should overlook Penny's desperation and try to help her? Well, because that isn't how you've been acting. You've been acting like you don't want anything to do with her. I know, I said, but maybe, maybe the fair thing, if we could just get her some help, at least point her in the right direction. Liar. Adam's shout spooked another dozen witnesses into flight. Maybe the fair thing, he mocked. This isn't about what's fair or nice. The truth is you don't give a damn about Penny. This is about Julie. And um, just to explain, Julie, Julie is... Yeah, yeah. Julie right. is the woman that that Andrew works for, um, and she is yeah she's got her own virtual reality startup. So, actual virtual reality also plays into the novel, and he's got a big crush on her, and so is it's basically her idea to put the Penny and Andrew together. And uh, Andrew plays along against his own better judgment at first, in part because he just wants to impress her. So that's that's what that's about. And also uh, in this in this uh, little scene here, um, the the other souls or witnesses rather, they uh, uh, these are other little personalities that were split off in this um, dissociative personalities. Or Tsai Cheng says in the chat, um, it's now. I, I'm actually not sure if multiple personality disorder now actually has officially been change to dissociative personality disorder the, the the original the official name now i think is dissoci dissociative identity disorder but i i went with multiplicity because i i just that's what that's the name that everybody knows it by and and right. i wanted to you know um but yes the the hierarchy in andrew's head like there are there are the the sort of more well-developed souls the ones with names and then the witnesses are basically more like what would be called fragments. They're basically, they're embodiments of a single traumatic memory and they never go out. Their job is just to bear witness to what happened. 
And so right. they, yeah, they're like little kids, basically. They, they bore witness to the trauma. And only in Second Life, as we're talking about uh, dissociative personality disorder, appears a rabbit right behind me on the sofa with the name My Next Incarnation. Matt can't see it. Uh, if you turn around, you see him. <laughs> he appeared right on time. Uh, My Next Incarnation, welcome to the book club. Please do take a seat in the uh, audience or stay there if you wish. Um, I wanted to say, uh, I mean, you you said it uh, already here. The, the 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 surrounding plot or the world is a virtual reality startup company, and uh, I I couldn't believe it when I start reading this because I did my civil service in Germany in a social uh, psychiatric institution, and I was I always wanted to pursue a, a career in in psychiatry, and then I don't know, I became a musician, which is uh, very related, I guess. No, it's probably not, but. That, that that you uh, put this together with virtual reality, I thought was a was a brilliant um, uh, juxtaposition here. Is it, did, did you have other alternative ideas when you thought like, okay, I want to write something about uh, somebody who deals with this condition? Well, this was inspired by actually my wife was friends with somebody who had actually done this, who who was multiple and had created an imaginary house in his head as a as a coping mechanism. And when I heard about that, I was just fascinated by it because I, I had not heard of that before. And so and it just seemed to me coming from, you know, having spent a lot of time, maybe too much time playing computer games that, of course, this is yes, this is like an alternate reality construct. Mm -hmm. And it was a way of sort of, uh, I think, both, you know, having, you know, helping, helping readers understand what I was talking about. And it also just tied in naturally to have him working at a place that did, you know, that did uh, virtual reality. Um, and, and the idea also that the, the character of Julie is one of these people who is constantly having these, these wild ideas. So when she finds yeah. out that Andrew has this house in his head, she's like, oh, I've got to hire you. You're an expert <laughs> in what I'm trying to do. Even, and he doesn't know what she's talking about at first, but yeah, sounds sounds like Silicon Valley in a way, but uh, I I digress. Um, now, uh, yeah, and and also, I mean, it goes without saying. People in the chat here are are, are chatting. Uh, Arden is saying it it'll be renamed again in the DSM six. Uh, it 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 just might be. But um, what I loved about this book also is, of course, that it sort of lays bare that uh, we all have multiple, you know, personalities. Um, not in the in the sense that we're all traumatized, but we constantly negotiate with each other. And the emotional intelligence that Andrew, the main character, has is is not uh, available to, for example, Julie and some of the other characters in the book. So right. that's it's 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 a wonder, it's a wonderful book. And now this is actually where I cheated, where I did look at your blog because uh, you wrote about the next book, Bad Monkeys. Um, you wrote that you had. Uh, all this critical acclaim with this book where you where you treat this with 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 gravitas and you could have um continued on this path but no you decided to just you know knock out a, a shorter uh book a uh, thriller type book with also um a uh, possibly schizophrenic uh, protagonist at the helm uh, talk a little bit more about that choice um going going from this one to bad monkeys but what do you mean i mean is bad monkeys like uh, it was Bad Monkeys was this it was it was this little gem of a story that you know it, it was very it, it's just much more straightforward it's like one main character instead of a cast of thousands and it's a very you know it's this woman in a in a uh, psychiatric ward telling her story to a psychiatrist and she she's been arrested for murder and she claims that she used to work for a secret organization that fought evil and that you know that but the guy she killed was not on the official kill list. So she's been abandoned by the organization that she worked for. And so she's telling the story of how she came to work for this, this uh, what, what's called the organization. Her division is called Bad Monkeys, that they are, their official job is to take care of especially evil people. So, um, so it's the story of how she got involved in this and how it went wrong. And it's, just, it's, a, it's a very short, straightforward story and and of course i wasn't expecting big things from it and and of course it's the one you don't expect to be a big deal that that becomes a breakaway success so this but, was but you, but you were suggesting also that that you could have you know like a movie director who does something very you know i don't know spielberg with schindler's list let's say and continues on that path is it is it kind of that, that is that what you meant by by going 
uh, well, it was just that you know, set this house and set this house in order is a very long novel and very involved, and I spent a lot of time thinking about it before I worked on it. And I could have come up with another big, big thinky project like that, um, but instead, I just had this you know cute little idea for a, a, what I was calling my Philip K. Dick novel because that's kind of what it, it reminded me of. Um, so uh, that was what I that was what I chose to do next, and it turned out to be you know I, I was it's just because I it, it just seemed to me if you were if you were being deliberate about your career you would follow right. this long thoughtful novel right. with another long and thoughtful novel and said nope I'm going to do something different so right um, okay quickly setting this up so Jane is accused of murder and, and this excerpt is uh, her in dialogue with her psychiatrist in, in, in prison actually and she claims that her job is a hired assassin for a, a, an organization called the organization and her department is the department for the final disposition of irredeemable persons and uh, she claims that uh, what happened was that a janitor at the high school the local high school was a serial killer named Angel of Death the psychiatrist in this excerpt confronts her uh, with, um, you know, p police records and I think uh, uh, news articles that uh, suggest otherwise that the the serial killer Angel of Death was not that janitor, and that not, uh, this does not have to do with anything. And so, uh, please go ahead, Matt. The next time the doctor enters the room, he's carrying a second file folder thick with evidence. Checking up on my story, she guesses as he deals the folder's contents into three neat piles on the table. He nods. I don't like to confront patients, but in prison psychiatry, I find that taking an aggressive tack early on can be very useful. For separating the con artist from the genuine head cases, she looks amused. So what's the verdict on me? He offers her the first of his evidence piles. This is a report filed by the Madera County Sheriff's Office in late September 1979. A man named Martin Whitmer was found dead in his van in a roadside ditch outside Fresno. Whitmer had worked as a janitor at a rural high school, but quit his job after an unidentified student accused him of being the Route 99 killer. Well, there you go. It's just like I said. Not quite. He flips to a page near the bottom of the pile. There's no mention of a bullet wound in the autopsy. Mr. Whitmer died of a coronary. Yeah, I know. I told you, I shot him with an NC gun. The doctor thinks a moment. NC stands for natural causes? <laughs> right. Sorry, I thought that was obvious. The gun shoots heart attacks. Myocardial infarction, she says, tapping a finger on the cause of death line in the autopsy report. MIs. In the CI setting, that's for cerebral infarctions. Heart attack and stroke, the two leading killers of bad monkeys. She smiles. So what else have you got? He pushes forward the second pile, which consists of just two sheets, printouts from a newspaper microfilm reader. It's a story from the San Francisco Examiner with the questioning headline, Angel of Death Hangs Up Wings? 16, 16 months after the Route 99 serial killer claimed his last victim, she reads aloud, state police are beginning to hope that the so-called angel of death, whose identity remains a mystery, may have gone into retirement. Yeah, see, I told you the cops didn't believe me about the janitor. So even after he turned up dead, they thought the angel was still out there. The doctor points to a circled paragraph farther down the page. Keep reading. 13-year-old David Konovic, the boy believed to have been the angel of death's eighth and final victim, disappeared from a Bakersfield gas station on December 12, 1979. December, the doctor says, three months after Whitmer was found dead. Are you sure the newspaper didn't screw up the date? He slides the last evidence pile across the table. The sheriff's report on David Konovic's abduction. The date matches, and when the boy's body was recovered, he was found to have been tortured and strangled in the same manner as all the other angel of death victims. So what does that tell us? I don't know. Come on, Jane. You want me to say Whitmer couldn't have been the angel of death, is that it? Doesn't that seem like a reasonable conclusion? No. Why not? Because he was the angel of death. Now, this was Bad Monkeys, and I just wanted to say uh, I was told by my producers we can go over time today, so we, we're not under a uh, crazy time crunch, and I also uh, want would like to thank Matt again from the bottom of my heart that you, I sent you all these readings and they're quite massive and we get a real treat today. And uh, thank you, Matt, for-, for No, no, this is for fun. Ag no. Agreeing, yes. It, it, but I mean, you know, you call this sort of a quick, I mean, Bad Monkeys is also, uh, the, the plotting is is brilliant. You know, I mean, I worked in a, in a psychiatric institution as, as a young man and it's, it's the, the way you present this is just so, brilliant that the 
Jane um, was a fun character to write. Jane Charlotte, that's the name of the protagonist in Bad Monkeys. And yeah, she's what I loved about everything her was everything she like, says, it could be true. It could everything could absolutely be true. And then the psychiatrist pokes these little holes in there. Um, and then the next chapter, she's there again, and it, it could be that conspiracy. I mean, we live in this world, Matt. I mean, is this QAnon or what is happening? Well, no, that was the thing about Jane is that she's, she, she's her two superpowers. One, she can confess to anything and make you like her anyway. And, mm -hmm. and second, that if you catch her in a lie, she doesn't get embarrassed. She just keeps going forward and comes up with an explanation of like, no, it's not a lie. This is, this is why it seems like I'm lying, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, she was a great, great fun character to write. It is it's certainly much more fun than the current uh, uh, real life uh, QAnon, uh, people who believe in QAnon and who can also explain every every uh, weird thing that's happening in the world by the existence of Q who will save us all. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, God bless. Yeah, uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> don't, uh, yeah, shut up the news. Uh, the Mirage is next. The Mirage is 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 awesome. It's it's a it's a crazy alternate history where the 9/11 terror attacks actually happened on 1109. Interestingly, of course, in Germany, this this is pretty much 9/11 in, in, yep. in German because it's twisted around. And in the book, uh, the the attacks are perpetrated by um, American terrorists. The um, uh, America is uh, basically uh, a a, fa a failed state. Uh, or failed accumulation of states, would you say? It's it's basically yeah. The, it, it's set in a world where basically the U.S. and and the Middle East have traded places. So the 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 last superpower is the United Arab States, which is all the Arab countries consolidated as one big republic um, with the capital in Riyadh and the financial center in Baghdad and. America, it's never fully described, but basically it's broken up into smaller third world countries is how people refer to it. And yeah. the, patchwork the, kind yeah, of the, like... the East Coast is the, I think, I, I forget, was the Christian states of America or something like that, that are the, that's basically the East Coast with its capital at Washington, D.C. And that is the America that gets invaded in the wake of the 11-9 the attacks. But even though the terrorists are actually from Texas. Which so is, the terrorists uh, are from Texas, and by invasion, you then of course mean the the uh, the United Arab States, uh, which yeah. is a modern, uh, flourishing, you know, democracy, modern, yeah. uh, democracy very Democratic diverse, Republic. secular, but also accepting of of various religious stuff. They of course uh, in in invade as as we or America has in, in invaded. Um, uh, set up a green world. zone in Washington D.C., exactly. which goes about as well as you would expect. So yeah. And you have Osama bin Laden, who is a senator. You have Saddam Hussein, who is a thug. You've got Rumsfeld, and I'm editorializing here, a bunch of other clowns uh, like Paul Bremer and other people um, in there in different roles. And One thing now, that isn't different is that, yes, people who are evil in our world are still evil <laughs> in this world, but they have different job prospects. So Osama bin Laden is a, a, a respected senator who, and war hero who is secretly plotting against the republic and... Saddam Hussein can't be a, a, a dictator, so instead he's like basically the head of the Baghdad Mafia. Um, and, and his sons are also pretty, yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he's he's the yeah, he's the Tony Soprano of Baghdad, basically, and his sons are worse. So Mrs. Lady um, says in the chat, I'd like to see that made into a movie. I completely agree. I mean, uh, congratulations I, I to would, Lovecraft I would Country. Too. But, yeah. Right? I mean, this is the one that they should make into a they could make it a series. Well, it was, I originally had pitched it as a TV series in 2007, and, and you can imagine how well that was received as an idea at the time. But um, So I wrote it as a novel because I, I couldn't get any traction on a TV show. But um, Well, at least uh, I'm not going to go off the tangent with Donnie Darko. Look it up. Donnie Darko is a, is a fantastic film, but um, an airplane falls out of the sky. That was not uh, a film that was very successful in 2001. But uh, what you're reading here now, and you intersperse the book with with excerpts of the uh, Arab version of of Wikipedia, basically the Library of Alexandria, and and this stopped me in my tracks very early on. Uh, there is an entry in the Library of Alexandria in in this book about Israel. So uh, you're going to read uh, what what Israel is in your in your alternate uh, sure. story here, alternate history. The Library of Alexandria, a user-edited reference source. Israel. 
This page is currently protected from editing to deal with repeated acts of vandalism. To suggest changes, please contact an administrator. The modern state of Israel is a country in Central Europe. It is bordered on the north by the North Sea, Denmark, and the Baltic Sea, to the east by Poland and the Czech Republic, and to the west, in part, by the Netherlands. The rest of its western and southern borders are officially defined by the courses of the Rhine and Main rivers, but since the 1967 Six-Day War, Israel has occupied most of Bavaria, Schwabia, and the west bank of the Middle Rhine. Israel's capital is Berlin. History. Following the defeat of the Third Reich, the UAS spearheaded a plan to partition Germany into two states, one Jewish and one Christian. The same 1948 Act of Congress that officially recognized Israel's sovereignty also established a new religious district in Jerusalem, Palestine, and guaranteed Israeli citizens direct access to the Holy City through special visitor visas. In the aftermath of the 11-9 attacks, new security restrictions were placed on these visas. See the 2002 Arafat Abbas Amendment to the Law of Return. Both Israel's existence and its geographic location remain controversial. British Prime Minister David Irving is only the most recent of Europe's leaders to call for the Jewish state's destruction. Meanwhile, many Northern American evangelical Christians would like to see the Jews permanently relocated to the site of the historical land of Israel, believing this to be one of the necessary preconditions for the end of days. Despite recent tensions, the UAS continues to be Israel's closest political and military ally, with the two countries operating as partners in the war on terror. So, yeah, you can see why this sort of thing, particularly in 2007, was considered a bit too controversial to, to try and do as a, as a TV show. But yeah. Um, and also, I mean, you, I mean, the United Arab States, they have their own, uh, speaking of TV shows, they, of course, have a show that's called 24-7 Jihad. Yeah. Uh, and uh, people could guess what uh, what the analog with that <laughs> what that was. I mean, brilliant, brilliant book. Okay, now uh, we do have uh, extra time allotted to us by our friends uh, over at Linden Lab. If you're just tuning in, Matt Ruff is here and he's uh, reading from all of his books. Um, uh, we're 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 closing in on the. Um, on on the on the current book what we now have to go over to uh lovecraft country lovecraft country was just announced uh it will be uh premiering as a series on hbo uh max i believe in uh august august 16th august 16th amazing and i'm putting some uh little uh screenshots from the trailer here in the in the back uh, this is set in 1954 uh in chicago the the protagonists start in chicago they go on a journey to new england um a, a young man is looking for his missing father and he discovers that uh, aside from pr police brutality and everyday casual racism there is another type of horror there are people who are trapped in other dim dimensions I, I i love this book and i say it again i'm bummed that uh, hbo made that one and not public works in the mirage but maybe that's just the start Matt. right i mean if this is a success they they'll pick the first pick one is the hardest it, yeah. so hopefully hopefully this will this will you know get more attention for my other novels as well but um yeah so again to summarize this each it's it's an episodic novel so each chapter focuses on a different member of this extended uh, black family and their friends and um so the section i'm reading from involves a woman named ruby who's um She's an African American, but she goes home with the wrong guy on New Year's Eve and wakes up in the body of a white girl. And um, he was running, screaming out into the street and finds herself in downtown Chicago and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and at one point is staring at herself in a department store window, looking at her white reflection. Um, and this is a winter display and there's pictures of snow covered mountains in the display. And so she's thinking of what name would I give my white alter ego in the mountain? And it was it's not Karen. I'm sorry, I had to say this. No, 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 no. It, <laughs> it was it, Hillary. The uh, mountains made her think of, of Mount Everest, which has just been you know, summited the year before. So she decides to, to name this white girl Hillary. Uh, after Edmund Hillary. Mm -hmm. um, and she ends up a little later in having lunch with a, a white policeman, and that is the, the part I'm reading from here. Roman, huh? The cop whose name was Mike said. Sounds like a real asshole. Excuse my language. No, Roman's a nice boy, she said. At least I thought he was. If he cheated on you, he's an idiot. Maybe she had gone crazy after all. She hadn't really intended to have lunch with him, but when they got to the restaurant, a diner tucked under the Lake Street L tracks, the queasiness in her stomach evaporated and she realized she was starving. 
So instead of making an excuse to get away, she went in and sat down and talked. She told him she was Hillary Everest, a tourist in town for the holidays. Hillary Everest. Mike the cop didn't even bat an eye at that, and the thought came to her again that she could say anything to him, anything at all, and he'd believe her. Entranced by the novelty of a policeman taking her words at face value, she kept going, making up a whole story about her holiday adventures in Chicago, complete with a supporting cast of characters. Her fool nephew, Leo, her spoiled cousin, Catherine, and dear old Aunt Effie, with whom she'd been staying. And when she got the inevitable question about whether she had a boyfriend, she conjured up Roman, her steady back home, who she just this morning learned had been stepping out in her absence. Watching Mike get, get aggrieved on her behalf, exactly as she predicted he would, gave her a weird thrill. This must be how it had felt for Mama holding her seances. And though it was wrong, hearing the lies come out in Hillary's voice, with Hillary's reflection faint but visible in the window beside the booth, made it feel less wrong somehow. Less Ruby's sin, anyway. So you're headed home tonight, Mike said, to Springfield, Massachusetts. She nodded. I've got to be at work on Monday. It's a shame you're not staying longer. Oh, I'll be back, she said, making him light up. Yeah, when? This summer, maybe, improvising. I was talking to Ed Effie about making ta maybe taking some courses at the university here. What kind of courses? Journalism. You want to be a reporter? For the first time, he sounded skeptical, though of the idea, not of her. My brother Marvin's a reporter, she said, a touch defensive. No reason I couldn't be, too. Hey, he put up a hand. If that's what you want, if you do come back, you should give me a call. I'll show you the town for real. Maybe, she said. Mike finished his coffee. Well, listen, he told her. I should get back out there. No, you stay. Sit. Have some dessert. And don't worry about the check. It's taken care of. He jotted his phone number on a napkin and gave it to her. You have a safe trip home. And tell that Roman guy that Mike says he's a jerk. She watched him walk out, waved to him as he passed on the sidewalk, then focused on Hillary's reflection in the glass. Bad girl, Ruby told her, but Hillary just smiled, shameless, and Ruby felt herself smiling too. She thought, revenge, free lunch, my own police escort if I want. What else comes with being you? Dessert, miss, the waitress said. Ah, uh, brilliant. White privilege, huh? White pri privilege right there. You're not getting um, uh, looked at weirdly, uh, beaten up by police, and uh, you can have dessert at the, at the end, too. The, it's speckle and hide in reverse, basically, yeah. It's wonderful, and it's being developed, and uh, we're, I wanted to, uh, actually, I have here on the run sheet a question about, um, broadly about cultural appropriation, but I really don't want to get too deep into it um for the in the interest of time but just briefly uh did you get any pushback for this book because you're white and you're reading uh, you're writing something that is so deeply no. uh, uh seated in the african american experience and i also want to add for context the 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 main protagonist here the uncle of the main protagonist is the publisher of the safe negro travel guide so of course a, a take on the green book and um there, there is tremendous violence. I mean, it's it's very realistic, and then you have the Lovecraft universe on top of it. But yeah, what was your res what was the response when when this came out? I mean, again, yeah, this is a very long topic that I could talk about for a while. But the short answer is no. I, I I've I've gotten no you know real problem with that, and I, I black readers in particular have been incredibly welcoming and and. Um, the real rule, if you know, if you're a white author wondering about this, it's not what you've heard. The rule is basically that, you know, at least in my experience, black readers want the same thing that white readers do generally. They, the first and most important thing is they want a well-told, engaging story. Um, the second thing is they want to feel included in in whatever game you are playing as an author. And the the third thing is they just don't want to be gratuitously insulted. So if you if you can do all of that and you know, try to do psychologically realistic characters rather than lazy stereotypes, uh, you, you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, you know, the only, the only contrary uh, thing, you know, I've gotten have been from, there's a subset of progressive white liberals who have issues with this, but it, it's really true that, that the, I can count on two hands the number of times I've, I've had people say anything about this, and it's invariably been white folks who, I don't know, just had ideological problems with it, but uh, black readers have been incredibly welcoming. And, and uh, so that's really all I cared about. That's wonderful. And it, it goes without saying that the, that the series is being developed by a stellar 
production talent, all African Americans, as far as I can tell from the trailer and from what's being. You should bring this to showrunner. She she she's known for doing Underground, which is another great series that got canceled way too soon. Um, that was uh, basically the Great Escape set in a slave plantation. Um, Jordan Peele is executive producing, and it was obviously Jordan and the success of Get Out that helped grease the skids to get this greenlit at HBO. Um, and J.J. Uh, Abrams, like God, is somewhere in the background as, you know, the the executive, executive producer. So, um, yeah, and the, it's just an amazing cast and an amazing crew. And I think it's going to be a great show. So uh, it, August 16th. And uh, people always say, should I read the book first? And I'll let me answer this. Yes, you should. Uh, <laughs> I usually stay away from movies and shows if I like the book. And that's just my thing. Everybody has a different thing. But I feel that the, the, the even if the show is well produced and, and really top talent, I feel something is taken away from me because of the, the, the show that I build up in my own head. Right. I mean, it's like with the never ending story is an ex extreme example because the, the book is genius. And if they would make the never ending story today with with a good budget and with the special effects, it would probably be very different. But uh, I have offended many American friends of mine when I said that the never ending story film is the worst thing that ever came out. Uh, because it destroyed the book for me, kind of. I've actually never seen it, so uh, good. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and with the the cultural appropriation thing, I I, I also think because last uh, last book club we had LL McKinney here, and we we discussed uh, what I would call it, you know, a, a debacle with uh, American Dirt, which is a very very different. Uh, issue here, where somebody uh, really uh, kind of pretends to 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 know, a, a white person uh, pretends to know how it feels when you are a migrant laborer and uh, being exploited by the system. I don't even fault uh, Janine Cummings, the author, as much as the system that gives that person the chance to to be so widely distributed. And uh, I guess the system sh or you know the publishing industry should consider th stories I, like I, that more from the source. I haven't read that, and so I can't really comment yeah. on it. But it struck me that part of the problem there, that was just an advertising failure where it was held up. Like it sounds like from the reviews I've read that it actually works quite well as a thriller. The problem is when you position it as a, as a sort of woke social narrative, that provokes all kinds of, of additional commentary. And I, I just yeah. think that was probably a bad way to, to pitch it. Um, right. that, that's a good I point. I don't, I don't begrudge anyone the right to tell a, you know whatever story they want. It's just that, yeah, you if you if you set yourself up as the voice for you know a, a certain group of people, and, and particularly if you suggest that you're the only one doing this, that's just begging for trouble. Right. And that was another thing I was very careful to do with Lovecraft Country. It's like this is my my take on a story, but you know. Uh, it, one one author cannot exhaust the black experience, quote unquote. It's like uh, there's there's as many potential stories there as people want to write. So I, I you know that's that's just the mistake people make is when they first of all they show their ignorance when they pretend nobody has ever written this before. And so I exactly I, yeah, yeah just focus on telling a good story and don't pretend you're like the only person to think of this stuff and you'll be fine. I do think, and I also want to say for the record that I haven't read American Dirt, so I cannot comment on uh, the validity of the story or the experience or, or uh, whatever. I do see it as a general problem that certain privileged people are have a seat at the table versus people who live a specific experience generally uh, may not be invited to sit at that table. And that's not the fault of a specific a successful author. That's the a fault of a system that does not invite uh, people who could be very, very talented. That applies to any other uh, artistic endeavor as well, you know. Um, and uh, that's uh, that's my take on it. Uh, Jules is uh, <laughs> this set of Jules. Jules in the in the local chat is is giving us the rundown on on American Dirt. But let's move on to the to the latest book. And Jules, I'm not uh, you know I'm not uh, censoring your opinion. Please. Please keep uh, putting he here in the chat. But in the interest of time, we now have to move on to 88 Names. 88 Names is about virtual reality. It's about games. Uh, it's 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 a streamlined, fast-paced uh, thriller. And when I interviewed you before, I asked you, were you not afraid? But I think you already answered that question in another context. Are you not afraid of um, 
uh, ha, you know, in a crowded field of, I don't know, virtual reality stories like, you know, Snow Crash and uh, whatever else is out there that that you can't offer uh, something new to this. Um, no, but, I mean, again, I, 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 I love those kinds of stories. So I would know if I was just repeating what I had seen before. And um, I was pretty comfortable with this. So just to give a quick intro to people who are not familiar with this. So this is set about 20 years in the future when VR has sort of you know achieved the platonic ideal that we're all hoping it will eventually grow into. And protagonist John Chu is what is known as a Sherpa, which is a paid guide to online role-playing games. So say you want to play the futuristic equivalent of World of Warcraft, but you have a real life, so you don't have you know 200 hours to spend building up your character, you can pay him a fee and he will provide you with a ready-made high-level character and a group of skilled teammates and basically cater an adventure for you. And um, so one day he gets a, a new client who calls himself Mr. Jones, who claims to be a, a rich, famous person with powerful enemies. And uh, you know he doesn't want to give away his real identity, but he's offering $100,000 a week for a, a comprehensive tour of the world of virtual reality gaming. And this is one of those sounds too good to be true deals, but he's willing to pay the first week in advance and the money is real. So John Chu takes the job. Then as the, the tour gets underway, he begins to suspect that, that Mr. Jones is actually North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. Um, and the first two thirds of the novel are set entirely in virtual reality in either virtual games or virtual chat rooms or other virtual environments. Yes, and 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 old old style old style uh, muds uh, text right. only uh, multiplayer games. Um, uh, so everybody has yeah, yeah, everybody has total control over how they look and sound, and you know, machine translation has advanced to the point where you can pass yourself off as a native speaker of a language you've never studied. Um, and most of the people John is interacting with, not just Mr. Jones, but uh, you know his coworkers and even his ex-girlfriend, are people he's never actually met in real life. And you know you can you can look people up on social media if they give you their real name, but even there, it's being mediated through the computer, so you don't know how much of it, what you're looking at is true. So it's this constant guessing game of of who he's really dealing with. And but and it's also really empower. Sorry, Matt, I'm stepping on you because no, now no, no, we're no, at a ahead. subject that is so exciting to me because also the embodiment enables us to uh, maybe go deeper uh, with each other in communication without judging one another so quickly based on our physical appearance. Um, I have uh, Strawberry from Linden Lab, big shout out. She's streaming right now and she's uh, helping with the tech and she's producing this show uh, ostensibly. I have worked with her for 12 years here in Second Life and I've never met her ever. Yeah. And um, she hopefully still uh, will produce me after this show. Sorry, Strawberry, <laughs> I had to say it. I love you. Go ahead, Matt. So um, yeah, the, the section I'm going to meet, the, in addition to being, so obviously this is sort of a, a mystery and a cyber thriller. It is also in a weird way, a romantic comedy, or at least the closest thing to a romantic comedy. Very much so, comedy. yeah. So um, I'm going to read the, uh, a, a bit of backstory where a, a John Chu talks about meeting his ex-girlfriend Darla for the first time. And I just need to set this up a little bit that to explain Please. what this, something called the mom and pop switch is. Um, so this is where John is talking about his avatar and, and the mom and pop switch. My avatar has fewer acne scars than I do, but the main difference between us is what I call the mom and pop switch. It's a piece of code created by a friend of mine, Jamone Campbell, who's also biracial. Scott's English on his father's side and Yoruba on his mother's. Jamone's folks were divorced but shared custody, and growing up he noticed he got treated differently depending on which parent he was with. One day as an experiment, he took some public domain morphing software and created an avatar extension that allowed him to emphasize one side or the other of his ethnic heritage, in effect presenting as a blacker or whiter version of himself. The results surprised him. He expected it to affect people's behavior, he said, but wasn't prepared for how strong the effect was. I paid him on a hundred bucks to write a version of the code for my avatar. I use it as a business tool. The historical connection between Chinese hackers and gold farming has given rise to a stereotype that ethnic Chinese are natural born Sherpas, just as we are all biologically predisposed to score high on the SATs. So for initial meetings with clients, I like to put on my mom jeans. When dealing with customer complaints, on the other hand, I find that you can never be too Caucasian. So his father's white. Um, 
So anyway, yeah, yeah it, I mean, it's it it's it that's so brilliant, Matt. I'm so glad that you put that in there because there's there's many really cool concepts here, but this is one where it plays where where uh, and, 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 and I'm sorry, I, I just need to jump in. I interviewed a lot of people in Second Life, successful Second Life business owners, who told me some told me, well, my my main business avatar is is white and has a certain look, and that's why I think I'm more successful in this particular, you know, whatever it is, home and garden. Uh, and I also met a woman who has a, a man. I mean, this is not uh, ethnic, 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 ethnicity specific, but gender specific. And they are convinced that their second life business success is really predicated on presenting their brand with this uh, persona. So anyway, yeah. So anyway, the section I'm going to read opens with, and this is he. He first meets her in Call to Wizardry, which is the. The, my fictional version of World of Warcraft, and they, they're basically in the Jurassic Swamp farming dinosaur hides, and they end up kill-stealing each other's kills, and, and at one point, basically, they she challenges him to a fight, and despite having a lower-level character, kicks his ass handily, and he um, immediately ends up offering her a job. And he, he mentions this in passing earlier on in the novel, and this is sort of the, the the more expanded version of what happened. So, and it opens with a quote from the New Devil's Dictionary. Meet cute, a scene in a romantic comedy where a couple meet for the first time and realize they are attracted to one another. Such scenes are traditionally meant to be endearing, but modern versions of the meet cute often include behavior that in real life would be grounds for a restraining order. Fuck you, perv, is the first thing Darla ever said to me. It was in the Jurassic Swamp, right after she beat my ass the second time. Newly resurrected, I lay on the ground with my armor in tatters. At higher jib settings, you could see bone fragments and bits of intestines scattered all around me. Darla was an orc that day, a green-eyed orc with long blonde hair, and she loomed above me with her scimitar, ready for round three. When I asked her if she'd like to make some money, I guess it must have sounded like a weird come on. Fuck you, perv. Wait, I said, before she could kill me again. I didn't mean it like that. My name's John Chu, and I run a Sherpa crew. Sherpa Incorporated? Maybe you've heard of us? A Sherpa crew. Darla was incredulous. People pay you to be a guide? Are these retarded people? Seeing me frown. What, you don't like the word retarded? I don't mind it, but some of the clients do, and the ones who do really don't like it. Darla smirked in a way I would come to know well. So this is one of those jobs where you have to watch what you say, as if the concept of professionalism was the silliest thing she'd ever heard of. Is there a dress code too? No dress code. As long as you're not sending selfies to the clients, you can dress however you like. I bet you'd like me to send you a selfie, perv, smiling this time like she enjoyed whatever my face did when she said it. I decided to try selective deafness as a tactic. What's your name? Darla. Darla what? Why, so you can stalk me on Facebook? Can you tank? Of course I can fucking tank. What about healing? If I'm feeling suicidal and want to bore myself to death, sure. Do you play any other MMORPGs or first-person shooters? Ooh, you are planning to stalk me. As soon as you log out, you're going to Google Darla and the names of any games and see if you get a hit. Maybe find a nice picture of me to jerk off to, am I right? Selective deafness wasn't working. I want to know what other games you play because we're looking to branch out. Our client base is almost all Call to Wizardry players right now, but you might be disappointed if you did find out more about me, Darla said. I mean, I could be a guy for all you know, a fat, disgusting old guy with yellow underwear. If you can tank as well as you DPS, I don't care how much you weigh or what your underwear looks like. Or I might be a kid, a 12-year-old boy. What would that do for your per fantasies? You're not a 12-year-old boy. How the fuck would you know? Because I used to be one. When a 12-year-old boy plays a female character, he picks a human or an elf, not an orc. Darla glanced down at her avatar's bust. Orc cleavage is not the stuff of typical schoolboy fantasies. Maybe I'm a perv too. Maybe, I said, but I think you're a girl, the kind who used to get into a lot of fights in high school. Used to? She raised an eyebrow. It's hard to judge with the fangs, but you look more college age to me. You don't even know if this is my real face. Also, it's the middle of a school day in America right now. Who says I'm in America? Or maybe I'm cutting class. If you were, you wouldn't suggest it. This earned another smirk. Okay, Mr. Profiler, Darla said. Tell you what, you guess my age and I'll come work for you. How many guesses do I get? One, duh. All right, I said, but I get to ask you three questions first. 
Yeah, and what do I get? If I guess wrong, $100. Fuck you, $100. How do I know you'll pay? I shrugged. How do I know you won't lie to get the money? Darla thought it over. Okay, three questions. On your 10th birthday, I asked, was the President of the United States a man or a woman? A woman, which makes you at least 18. On your 18th birthday, what actor was playing Doctor Who? You watched that stupid show? What actor? You can look it up on Wikipedia if you need to. I didn't say I didn't know. It was that Pakistani actress, Miriam, what's her name? Miriam Halil? She's from Wales and her family's Turkish. Whatever, her. Okay, so you're either 21 or 22. Last question. On your 21st birthday, if I showed you a meme of King Charles offering Camilla a hot dog bun, would you know what that was about? Darla rolled her eyes. Fine, I'm 22, she said. That's a really lame parlor trick. It's a simple trick. I nodded at her scimitar. Like DPS is simple if you're talking about the mechanics, but to do it under pressure without stopping to think, that takes some skill. Plus, the Doctor Who nerdery really wows the ladies, am I right? I do all right with the ladies, I said, and I'm definitely a nerd. But to be honest, I'm not a Doctor Who fan. I think I've seen like three episodes. Well, that's even more pathetic. You don't watch the show, but you memorize the star's bios in case you need to guess someone's age. I didn't need to memorize anything. I told you, it's on Wikipedia. You checked Wikipedia? Just now while you were talking to me? Yeah. No. Bullshit. It's a simple B-channel exploit. I held up my hands, made tapping motions with my fingers. You can't type and talk at the same time? Of course I can, and I can read and talk too. But I was watching you. You didn't cut your eyes away. You were looking at me the whole time. My avatar was looking at you. I have a custom mod, You So Interesting. It keeps my avatar's eyes focused on whoever I'm talking to, even if I'm checking a pop-up screen. This mod, it's something you wrote? An old girlfriend. Darla snorted. That must have been some relationship. We didn't use it on each other. You didn't use it on her, maybe. So this is for your clients? You watch porn while you're making your sales pitch? Mostly I use it to look up things on the sly. It helps me keep up my end, making small talk. And I always know the answer to game-related questions, even if I have a brain fart. Clients expect that. It's part of the whole Sherpa stereotype. As I said this, I gave the mom and pop switch a push towards the mom side. It was just a nudge, but Darla saw it, and she got it, and she laughed. All right, she said. Maybe you're not a total loser, but I still think your clients are retarded. She gave it a beat, watching my expression, then burst out laughing again. Wow, you are going to be so much fun to mess with. In hindsight, I suppose I should have recognized that as a red flag. But in the moment, I was happy because it meant she was taking the job. So, um, yeah, that's, that's Darla, that's John. And yeah, that's a big part of the story. So Matt, thank you. This is absolutely fantastic. Let me just say, because this all happens with, with headsets, of course, in, in VR. And, uh, uh, I, I can only say that in second life, since we're not headset compatible, the you so interesting mod, everybody has that. <laughs> no, that, that is true. <laughs> this is wonderful, and uh, I just uh, got uh, fired as a Linden Lab contractor because the F bomb was dropped ten times. But no worries, Matt. Uh, I'm sure you can get me oh, a job. Oh, are we allowed to say that on here? No, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So uh, uh, Maureen is giving you a, a big, uh, big compliment here. She says in the chat, "Not bad writing." I, I would, I would say so. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Maureen. Um, so this is 88 names and and i mean it's so it's such a wonderful book and you capture this and uh, you, you you capture the tone uh and the and the interactions i was joking in the chat and says you're describing a second life dating scene and jules said oh my god really i'm never gonna date an sl and that's not true oh yeah by the way please go yes yes go back to your wonderful chair here matt as we are um uh continuing and 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 wrapping um you capture the tone of of the interaction in these various games and the and the the power and the promise of these games. And you know, I mean, obviously, I'm a uh, I'm a broken record and an energizer bunny and evangelist running around telling everybody that the power of embodiment and placemaking and whatnot. And you are a a gamer uh, as well. Wait, there's a reason it, I only have seven novels. 
Yeah. Th- this does fascinate me because we talked about this before. I mean, you know, I, I accept uh, people for, for who they are, but uh, I, I was never really interested uh, uh, in, in gaming for whatever reason. Uh, but, but be that as it may, <laughs> I suppose you wanted to write this book for a long time. But the question I really have, the the peril, do you get when you do press around this book? Um, do you get questions? Because these are the questions that I get when I do interviews around Second Life. I was just uh, did a bunch of interviews because of the big resurgence of SL during the lockdown. Um, and the Telegraph was was just sort of probing me about, uh, well, yeah, but you don't know who anybody is. And, you know, could be predators, could be this and that. And it's always that very, very black and white um uh, a question and, and 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 you know you offer nuance you you don't want to dismiss these issues but um, are you getting any questions along those lines when you do interviews around this book? Not uh, yet, but but in part because of the pandemic, I haven't had as many interviews. So I mean, most of the people I've talked to, I think, are not the kinds of folks who would necessarily go down that road. Like I haven't I haven't spoken to the straight press yet. I don't yeah. think. Um, the straight press. Oh, sure. I'll take that better than the mainstream press. That's good. Is that a term? Uh, that's what I mean, I mean, no, it's, I'm just thinking in terms of yeah, you right. know, the uh, folks who are not maybe not as familiar with online life and and more likely to go with sort of stereotypical ideas of what it's about. Um, so I I'm sure it will come up, but no, not so far. That has not been an issue. I've I've um, I mean my. Uh, if you go on my website, there's a link. We did an 88 names podcast where we actually a friend Blake Collier and I. Um, ended up chatting with a bunch of different folks who work in in various aspects of virtual reality. Um, you know, from a director Brandon Oldenburg to um, you know tech designers to uh, Noah J. Nelson, who is into interactive theater. And it was very interesting. You know, th- these are people who are kind of the other way. They they see more potential to the medium than right. I even expected. So uh, yeah, um, they are drunk on the Kool Aid. But I mean, I, honestly, I, I think that at this point, you, you the the tech hurdle to get into uh, a, a situation to be fooled by someone's avatar is still high enough that I, I, yep. I think the the thing I'm more worried about are emails where someone successfully masquerades as a bank and gets you to click on something. I, I mean, it's it's the simple stuff that people who Absolutely. do not spend too much time online that are, are the bigger threat at the moment. Um, I, that, couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we have uh, Sarah Littman coming in. Um, uh, I don't have the calendar in front of you, but Sarah Littman is a YA author and she has a book coming out called Deep Fake. Um, yeah. and, and that's another thing that people should be much more worried about. I mean, we, we live in this world right now. So I think the the, the, the predatory nature of an, of an avatar or whatever, or to be fooled like you're describing in your book here with the with the mods and all that, uh, that super realism, we're, we're very far away from that, I believe. I mean, there are, there are predictable moral panics that will happen. I think once, you know, virtual reality goes more mainstream, it basically what's got to happen is somebody has got to figure out a way to make it cheap enough and easy enough to access that it becomes as popular as the PlayStation. And at that point, you're going to have a moral panic about people fooling each other online. Um, you know, when cyber sex becomes a bigger thing, there will definitely be moral panic about that, probably organized around, well, how do you know the age of the people you're having cyber sex with? Um, well, you know, I can tell you that with the $500 million economy that Second Life has, $500 million user to user transaction, a sizable portion of that uh, is uh, the adult industry here in Second Life. Um, we have attachments that, that run at a very high cost. Uh, I don't know that. I was just asking for a friend the other day, but uh, actually, <laughs> in the chat here, people are uh, talking about intellectually dating. It's interesting. I'm glad to hear over the chat. But yeah, the adult industry in Second Life is uh, is alive and well. I did a, a film, a bunch. Uh, I, I just did the Machinima and the music back in 2011 for German public television called Log Into Life. That um, Profiles a entrepreneur from uh, Florida by the name of Stroker Serpentine, who uh, made millions with uh, with adult content here in Second Life back in 2000, uh, well, the early days uh, from 2004 to 2008. Uh, I, I, I'm frankly more concerned with with indoctrination of of youth in in uh, games and virtual environments. To to be honest, Matt, I mean this is something that. As a father, I worry about, worry about. I mean, we have a lot of lot of uh, young people who are who have no who are looking for answers, and I think uh, very nefarious ideological 
uh, players are are roaming the the game streets and the world streets, and they're they're picking them off one by one. I, I mean, I, I the only thing I would say about that, remembering being young, is that trying to prevent people from looking at stuff that you think is going to harm them won't work. It will make it more attractive. What you've got to do is give people the tools to understand when they're being lied to, and then. And, and the best way to do more. that is let people expose themselves to a variety of different viewpoints, including really awful stuff. And you just, once you develop a sense for it, it's like, it, it you know, taboos, taboos are very seductive. But if you can diffuse that and just say, yeah, take a look at this, but there's nothing there. Or there's, you know, this is not, they're going to tell you this, but they're not going to talk about this and this. It, it just, the current, I, I spent, my, my main time online, I spent way too much time on Twitter. And there you definitely get this attitude of wanting yeah. to just, Anything that is a heretical point of view or a, a you know a, a quote unquote problematic point of view that there's this desire to just get rid of it and prevent people from looking at it and as a long term strategy that doesn't work because kids are very good at finding their way around you know shields and then they'll find themselves talking to somebody who's saying no no come on in we'll be friendly let me share some literature with you and then that's where people get seduced whereas if you you say <laughs> yeah. You know, it's that's that's the thing is that you can't you cannot shout these people out of existence. You cannot deplatform them out of existence. You've just got to teach kids how to say, "Yeah, I'm being lied to, and I I know it now." I I mean I don't disagree with you, but on the other hand, don't you think that plat, uh, deplatforming, uh, let's say Alex Jones um, from from YouTube, that that makes a difference? I mean, that it's just a it makes him smaller. It makes him less relevant and less able to also then sort of infiltrate the echo chamber of the mainstream media, I guess. I'm, I'm, I'm open to the possibility that some of these, these deplatforming or some of these larger people might have a positive effect, but I, I just, th the problem is that there is this strong bias among a lot of people that if I can't see it, yeah, it doesn't exist and no one else can find it either. And I just don't think that's true. I think that and particularly people who want to get messages out are going to be very clever about finding other ways to get the message out. So I, I it's not that it's not that censorship can't be effective. It's just that it, I think people overestimate its power. And actually, and, I like what Jules is saying. She uses the term economically kneecapping. I think that's actually nice because I think what's happening with Facebook is good when big advertisers are pulling out. Uh, sure. That that makes a huge difference. So that's a that, that's a development that uh, that I encourage. Um, it's just really hard to tell because nobody, the corporations who are doing this aren't doing it because they necessarily care about that. Course. They just want to look good, so they're going to make it seem like this is effective, even if it isn't. And I don't know. I mean, that's a that's a given. Yeah. They're not. They don't have any ideology other than making money and having a clean place to advertise. Yeah. Uh, so, they don't care either way. That's absolutely true. But on the other hand, you know, the a five billion dollar fine of Facebook uh, that the EU, uh, EU leveled, uh, they can shrug that off. But they may not be able to shrug off uh, advertisers leaving the open. And maybe then they think about uh, their their stance in 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 manipulating. Um, the population, and I think also in the case of Facebook, I'm not going to get off this. This is not a tangent. <laughs> this is related. No, no, I think it's important. But the internal uh, pushback from from people who work at Facebook is, I think, very encouraging and, and very important. Sure. Yeah. The other thing to watch out for, of course, is that th this is going to get game to be used against other people as well. That if you if you you know, get rid of some people who generally should be deplatformed, and then and then, but people are always going to think of okay, oh, yeah. well now how do I pick my ideological enemies this way, even if you know th this is overkill. So these are the things I think about. It's just it's not again, it's not that censorship can't work. It's just that particularly where corporations involved, I I just don't think people people. It's very hard to tell how effective it really is, and it's very hard to tell who to trust. So I I don't know. I and I, I think long term the the best thing is just learn how to be an intelligent consumer and, and teach your kids not to get fooled when somebody's lying to them or, you know, teach them how to think for themselves. That's, that's the best, if have an, you, idea, an, an immune I, system in your head so you don't have to worry about what you're exposed to. But I, you know, yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more, but we need to have the resources and uh, parents need to have the time and the, the public infrastructure needs to be strengthened so that uh, people who are, caught in the rat race with bad wages also are uh, feeling secure about where their kids 
learn the, 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 the basics to think critically and all this kind of good stuff. That's the other thing. I don't have kids. So this is that, that's another thing is I, I might, I might feel quite differently if I was, you know, and I would, I would certainly have more firsthand experience with the, the, the debate. I think if I had children, I was worried about. So it's, uh, it, 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 it also reminds me of Ender's. I just want to throw this out. Everybody needs to read Ender's game, but we are, uh, Ender's game is, uh, has a fascinating subplot, uh, also written by an author with very questionable views, uh, I wanted to ask you about how you feel about Lovecraft, but that's another tangent there. Um, we all know that uh, Lovecraft was, um, a, yeah, well, a tortured. He's a white supremacist, basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, well, we have to separate the art from the artist, can we? I, you know, I mean, my my take is always, I I, I think that the answer is just to understand that. Um, just because you are just because you are racist doesn't mean you can't also be a brilliant artist. And the problem comes when people want it to be one or the other. It's like if I if I tell the truth about what this person believed, then I can't like their art. Or if I like their art, I have to make apologies for their behavior. And I I, I just never I don't understand why you would need to make that distinction. I think it's important to be honest about you know who Lovecraft was and what he believed, in yep. part because he won't understand his creative choices if you don't get that it's just there you know it you can see it in the writing but that is true the, i get enough out of it anyway that i'm i'm not going to stop reading him i'm not stop going to be inspired by him but i'm at the same time i'm not going to lie about who he was and i i'm comfortable with that you know um i just but i do understand the dilemma people feel where you you tend to idolize the writers you you know if somebody speaks to you and it's it's painful to find out that they were somebody who in many ways you might not have liked at all. So um, I actually think it's a, very, I think it's very cool that you wrote this book and it's now de de uh, being developed by an all black um, production staff. And, uh, and, you know, that's, you know, that that's going to show Lovecraft. He's rolling around in his grave. Okay. I've been told by my producer who has been wonderful, um, wonderful, uh, despite having a, uh, an e I, I believe, an ear infection. Um, Strawberry, thank you so much. And Matt, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we, we are out of time, and I'm not going to go into audience questions. I'm sorry. Uh, but the, actually, I have a question for the audience. Which book are you going to pick up? Okay, like I said, this is a 90-minute infomercial. Look under your chair. There is 88 names. There is 88 names. There is the Mirage. Um, Next week, we have Peter Watts, a Canadian uh, writer of excellent uh, alien oh, invasion excellent. stuff. Yeah, maybe, Matt, I mean, Matt, you're always uh, welcome to hang out in the audience and, and hackle Peter and uh, ask him, you know, what, what, what's up with the pessimism or, or, or whatever. Um, it's at 12 o'clock. And uh, as, as always, Again, my thank you to Strawberry, to Patch, to uh, Brett. Big thanks to Silas Merlin, uh, Marianne McCann, AJ uh, McDowell. And uh, the reading list will be at bookshop.org slash shop slash reads. And thank you to the audience. Thank you guys for, for making this a huge success. And I'm really, really, really uh, grateful uh, and, and uh, happy that reading is not, uh, is not dead. What what are you what are you reading, Matt? Are you reading at all? Can no, a writer I, read? Oh sure. Um, I I mean I. I mean I guess I mean that... this in terms of balance. You know I mean I work in audiovisual stuff. I cannot watch. I cannot go to the theater. I don't want to watch movies. Uh, to me, reading is 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 the balance I need from the from from the day job, basically. I guess. I, I mean, it's funny. Binge watching television takes up a lot of the the time and bandwidth I used to devote to to novel reading. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, my wife and I just finished actually rewatching all of Justified, which is an amazing show. So um, I'm worried about still... you. <laughs> what, what's that? I'm worried about you. There's a lot of books that you need to be reading, Matt. No I, binge I... watching. <laughs> It's all it's all storytelling, man. That's that's okay. what I'm that's what I'm doing for. Okay, so people say here Mirage. I think it's a vote for the Mirage. Mirage, Mirage, Mirage. Uh, the one with uh, multiple personality dissociative disorder is called Set This House in Order. Um, and uh, yeah, we got Mirage and Set This House in Order. Um, and 88 names says Morin B. All right, that's it. 
folks. Oh, Tsai is asking a question. Thank you, Drex. Do you feel the negative stigma associated with watching TV as an author? Oh, that's an interesting question. Real quick, Matt, is there a is there a, a an elitism, a snobbery around watching television within the author community? Not which that is, I which am when aware you meet over the weekend or at the commissary. Oh, I just read Heinrich Böll, the clown. And what did you read, sir? Oh, yeah, what's justified? I, I, I've never cared about that. It's like it's again, if I'm enjoying myself, really, you know. I, I'm, I'm not worried about what other people want me to be doing. So, um, I mean, and again, it's, it's the, the storytelling on TV, especially long form is just very much speaks to me. So I, I, yeah, but no, at least the authors, I, I hang out back when we could hang out with people, you know, back when that's in the over. before time. Um, yeah, that's never been an issue. Uh, so you can I, hang out with Peter. What's next time and uh, next week? Okay, I'm going to yeah. wrap it. I'm going to be rude. Uh, please, Matt, if you will, can you jump up and down on the chair because people love this? Uh, sorry to so that. Get my uh, <laughs> keyboard's cutting out here. Let, there we go. <laughs> there you go. A Cthulhu monster jumping up and down. Thank you guys, and uh, we will see you all next Wednesday at twelve o'clock, Second Lifetime, right here at the Second Life Book Club. Thank you very much.